Hi, we're at the Palm Springs Photo Festival 2020 virtual edition. So thank you to Jeff Dennis, who found a way to pull this all together this week against all odds and many iterations. Um, in fact, this symposium came together last week. So I really want to thank all the panelists who agreed to participate on such short notice. So um, welcome. Um, I'm Juliet Wolf Robin. I'm the National Executive Director of American Photographic Artists, APA. APA is a not-for-profit trade organization of professional photographers. We're at apanational.org. We've been around since 1981. We are um, one of the leading professional photographer associations for commercial advertising, editorial photographers, photographers doing fine art. Um, our mission is for photographers to succeed, and we do that through community, education, and advocacy. Our symposium today is on diversity and inclusivity, and we have brought together individuals from grassroots organizations that are, who are working towards dismantling harmful practices in the visual journalism and editorial media industry. Uh, I can think of a more important topic to cover right now, and I really appreciate that these esteemed artists have come today to be a part of this. Thank you, thank you so much for doing this um, in one week and agreeing and participating. I think this is really important, so thank you. Uh, we have today Peter DeCampo, who is founder of the Everyday Projects. Polly Arungu, who is founder of Black Women Photographers, Jay Leonard, who is founder of Color Positive, Tara Pixley, who is co-founder and board member of Authority Collective, Jose Rivas, who is co-founder of Natives Photograph, Andrea Weiss, who is co-founder of Diversify Photo. And all of them have signed on to the Photo Bill of Rights, with five, six of the people here today being co-authors. We also have with us today Nader, Nader Khoury, who has been part of APA San Francisco board and also hosts uh, the APA BizTalk webinars. So he's helping out today and he'll be monitoring the questions. The Q&A is open. We may take questions during the webinar or if not, then certainly at the end. Um, to before we get started, we would like to start with the land acknowledgement um, presented by Jose. So Jose, can I pass it to you? Definitely. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Josue Rivas, and um, I come from the Mexica and the Otomis peoples uh, from Mexico. And I would like to acknowledge today that we're gathering in unceded territories of indigenous tribes all over North America and worldwide. And we'll also like to uh, invite all of us to acknowledging those communities, the elders, both past and present, as well as the future generations. We acknowledge that many institutions are founded upon exclusions and erasures of in indigenous peoples, including those on whose lands we are located today. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to, be to the beginning of the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and a step forward towards reconciliation and healing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna start with an introduction video of everyone's work. So let me share this with you. Peter DeCampo is a documentary photographer whose goal it is to contribute his work to a dialogue on international development and perceptions of Africa. He is a 2019 Stanford JSK Journalism Fellow and the recipient of grants and awards from Code for Africa, the Pulitzer Center, Magnum Foundation, Brown Institute for Media Innovation, Open Society Foundations, and Pictures of the Year International, among many others. His photography has appeared in the world's leading publications, and he's exhibited internationally, including solo shows in New York, London, and Rio de Janeiro. Peter is co-founder of The Everyday Projects. The Everyday Projects uses the power of photography to challenge the stereotypes that distort our understanding of the world, to combat harmful misperceptions, and to rise above persistent inequality. Polly Oringu has a degree in journalism from the University of Oregon. She's a multimedia journalist, digital editor, and self-taught photographer. 
Born in Nairobi, Polly has lived around the world, from Kenya to Kansas to Oregon and Washington, D.C., before ultimately landing in Brooklyn. As a photographer, Polly's work has been published in numerous publications, including Re Refinery29, NPR, Petapixel, The Washington Post, BuzzFeed, CNN, HuffPost, OK Player, and OK Africa. She is also digital content editor at New York Public Radio, where she is responsible for managing social media for WNYC and PRX's The Takeaway. Polly is the founder of Black Women Photographers, a global community and online database of black women and non-binary photographers. Jay Leonard is a New York-based photographer with Southern Roots who hails from San Jose, California. He is a portrait and commercial photographer who focuses his work in uplifting voices and stories necessary for change. Jay is the founder of Color Positive, a nonprofit organization focused on amplifying black artists in commercial photography, styling, and directing, as well as mentoring youth. Tara Pixley is a photographer and a professor based in Los Angeles with a 20-year career in visual journalism, teaching journalism and media studies at Loyola Marymount University. She holds an MFA in photography and a PhD in communications. Tara was a visiting Knight Fellow at Harvard's University Neiman Foundation for Journalism and was a recipient of the inaugural World Press Photo Solutions Visual Journalism Initiative. Her writing and photography have appeared in various publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Newsweek, ProPublica, HuffPost, Neiman Reports, ESPN, and The Black Scholar. Her film and photographic work intersect with her scholarship and advocacy, each addressing the problematics of representation and the possibility of contemporary visual media to reimagine marginalized communities. Tara is a co-founder and a board member of the Authority Collective, an organization dedicated to diversifying perspectives in visual media. She's currently working on a book chronicling the move to decolonize the visual journalism industry. Jose Rivas is a Mexican and Otomi creative director, visual storyteller, and educator based in Portland, Oregon, working at the intersection of art, journalism, and social justice. He is a 2020 Catchlight Leadership Fellow, Magnum Foundation Photography and Social Justice Fellow, and the winner of a 2018 Photo Evidence Book Award with World Press Photo. Jose's work aims to challenge a mainstream narrative about indigenous peoples, build awareness about issues affecting native communities across Turtle Island, and be a visual messenger for those in the shadows of our society. His work has appeared in National Geographic, The Guardian, The New York Times, and for brands such as Apple and Nike. The images we are looking at now are from his Standing Strong photo book, for which he also did a TEDx talk in Rapid City. Jose is co-founder of Natives Photograph, a space to elevate the work of indigenous visual journalists and bring balance to the way stories are told about indigenous people and spaces. Their mission is to support the media industry in hiring more indigenous photographers to tell the stories of their communities and to reflect on how these stories are told. Andrea Weiss is a contract photo editor on the History and Culture desk at National Geographic. As an independent photo, video editor, and producer, she works with brands, nonprofits, and editorial outlets to tell visual stories about the human condition. As co-founder of Diversify Photo, she is passionate about increasing representation of marginalized groups in visual media. She earned her MA in photography from Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Public Communications and a BA with honors in studio arts from Trinity College. Andrea has worked with National Geographic, Newsweek, ProPublica, BuzzFeed News, The Intercept, The New York Times, AARP, Open Society Foundations, among others. Her work has been recognized by the Tele Awards, the National Press Photographers Association, 
College Photographer of the Year, and the Student Academy Awards. Andrea is an alum of the Eddie Adams, Kalish, and Mountain Workshops. So let's start with Peter DeCampo and the Everyday Projects. Sure. Thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, I don't think I'm going to attempt a third person bio. Um, so I will just sort of say that I'm a photographer. Um, I'm, I'm based in uh, usually Nairobi. I'm in Seattle at the moment. Um, and <clears throat> I'll just launch into talking about the everyday projects. Um, so in, in brief, um, condensing our, our now eight year history, um, Everyday Africa was the first of the Everyday Projects. We started in, in 2012. Um, and uh, my background is that I was a, a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana um, after having studied photojournalism at Boston University. Um, and after the Peace Corps, when I started my freelance photography career, I stayed on living in, in Ghana and working as a, as a freelance photojournalist out of Accra. And, um, you know, basically always felt that my lived experience living and working in West Africa did not really match up with the assignment work that I did, did not match up with what I was asked to show the world about uh, my sort of new home region. Um, and so, you know, I was usually doing stories on uh, uh, a little bit of conflict, a lot of like disease prevention, a lot of poverty, et cetera. Um, and while those things are all present, I felt like they were a very limited view of, of you know, again, of what I was actually seeing as, as someone who's living there. Um, and in 2012, I was traveling on an assignment uh, in Ivory Coast with Austin Merrill, who is a, a writer and the co-founder of Everyday Africa. Um, and he and I, at the same time as doing this sort of post-war refugee story, uh, we started taking, making pictures on our phones, which was, you know, sort of novel at the time. Um, we felt that those photos were a much better representation of uh, the, the sort of holistic experience of a reporting trip. Um, it included a lot of daily life, it included the places we were staying, et cetera. Um, and when we posted those to, to Instagram and started the Everyday Africa account, um, it, it had this sort of immediate and viral reaction. Um, and people really were drawn to those photos. I think it was, you know, it was early days and even in a, in, in a social media sense, um, there was not a consistent place where you could get that kind of imagery. So, um, so we invited other photographers to join us. And that initial mission of wanting to go beyond the stereotypes of how Africa was seen, um, it was very obvious that that, um, that would sort of entail a pivot, or not necessarily a pivot, but an additional layer of like, well, we have to um, support and amplify the creative voices of African photographers across the continent. Um, the, I'll try to get even more brief here, but basically after Everyday Africa became very successful um, and, and viral, uh, we started to have copycats and we made them into partners. So there was Everyday Middle East and Brazil and Latin America and Asia and so on. And these were all sort of collectives of photographers wanting to change the narrative and show the local uh, uh, view of their own home regions or countries or cities. People have done it at all different levels. Um, and so when we became a nonprofit a few years ago, we called it the Everyday Projects. And you know we function as a sort of umbrella organization to support all of those storytellers. And uh, we also do a lot of work in schools, creating everyday projects with high school and middle school students across the US teaching them about um, our own new way of doing journalism and also trying to empower them with um, those storytelling skills themselves. So I'll leave it there for now, but yeah, thank you. That's awesome in a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, let's go on to Polly. Oh, I don't know how to go after that. <laughs> hey, everyone. I am Polly. I'm not normally based in Nairobi, but I am from Nairobi, Kenya. I always stay repping. <laughs> That's why I immediately loved everything that Peter has said and done with Everyday Africa and Everyday Projects. Um, I grew up in Kansas. 
So we moved to the States when I was, you know, about four years old. And, you know, from there, went to Oregon, and then went to Arkansas, then went to DC, and then went to Brooklyn. Now, here I am in Norman, Oklahoma, currently because of the remote situation. Um, and I'm the founder of Black Women Photographers. So it is a new baby. I just launched it um, July 7th, actually, did a soft launch on my birthday. Um, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yes, I launched it on my birthday. Um, you know, I just really wanted to do something and outside of what everyone was doing because I realized that, you know, I've been like sitting from afar, you know, just supporting and just like being like the cheerleader. Um, and I realized that, you know, I really wanted to contribute to the efforts, but also more importantly, you know, I just felt like I needed to do something. I think every time, you know, one thing in common with all these collectives, the, the burden is falling on the place of, you know, all of them and it shouldn't, uh, you know, all the issues and we'll get into that later, but all the issues and just the issues with the industry and just the work that they do. And it's a lot of unpaid labor work that they do. They've been doing all of this for years. So if you haven't already, please go and check out all of the organizations. You should be familiar with them by now. Um, and you should support, you know, with your pockets. I know they didn't tell me to say that, but I'm just saying it um, because I've been watching them like in my undergrad, um, you know, just seeing the incredible work that they've been doing for so long. Um, and they've supported me along the way, my journey. Um, and so with that, you know, um, back to Black Women Photographers though, but I launched it a couple months ago um, and it's a global database and directory. Um, you know, of Black women and non-binary photographers. Currently, I want to say <laughs> um, there's a little over 300. Um, I'm also just actively trying to upload people. Um, it takes a lot of time. And so there is like a backlog of folks that have not been up on the site. So hopefully I can finish that um, with some help at the end of this month. Um, but it launched with the COVID-19 Relief Fund because outside of Black women photographers, I have a day job. Um, so I work at WYC at New York Public Radio, where I do social for the show called The Takeaway. It's a daily national news program heard on NPR. And with that, you know, um, it, it's hard balancing it all, really. But, you know, with the support of everybody else and just the group of the energy within the group, it makes it worth it. Um, but you know, started with the COVID-19 Relief Fund is I realized, you know, I have a full-time job, so I've been able to take a step back and I haven't been able to shoot and I recognize the, the privilege I have in that. And so I really wanted to help. And so did that um, with the support of just like everyone just on Twitter and things like that. I was able to raise over 14,000 to help black women and non-binary photographers worldwide. Um, and so that most of the fund has been distributed. There's about 300 that has not been distributed, distributed left. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, get some more donations to distribute some more to actually make it an impactful small relief uh, to the recipients. And, you know, outside of that, like I said, it's the directory. And so right now, you know, a couple of countries, um, but mainly US focused, I really want to showcase like anyone in all levels. And so if you're interested, if you know someone who's interested, feel free to connect with me afterwards. Wow, congratulations. I mean, raising money is, is definitely a challenge and being able to figure that out and distribute that and pull that all together in such a short time frame is extraordinary. So, so bravo, I mean, really. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Jay, My Leonard. Pleasure. Oh. What was that? Uh, Jay, <laughs> Jay, Jay Leonard, <laughs> that was bizarre. Um, please tell us about your journey. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Um, so nice to be here. Um, and also see you, Polly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Color Positive started a year ago. Um, I'm a commercial and editorial photographer. Um, and well, I really entered the industry maybe like 16, 17 years ago. Um, as a creative assistant, uh, my background really kind of started in advertising. And um, as I was shooting for myself, um, I got a lot of opportunities to travel and work with different agencies, did some copywriting, have done production, I've done art design, I've um, opened up editorials, um, magazines, and just kind of going through an onset of many different positions in the field. I've garnered really great relationships um, and being a photographer now myself, um, a lot of those relationships uh, evolve around me making suggestions 
So, you know, after a little bit, after quite a bit of time of constantly getting emails from producers and other people just looking to create the right teams, um, but be diverse, um, specifically looking for black talent, um, I realized, you know what, I, I can make, you know, in 2019 and 2018, you can make a website overnight. Um, so it took me a few months to kind of start really gathering the talent. At that point, when I really sat down to make Color Positive, I had about 10 people in my brain that like I knew um, were ready to be on a sort of larger roster that aren't necessarily represented, but you know, needed to be seen more by the, the masses. Um, and then over the next six months, that kind of jumped into about, I think it's around 50 to 60 um, photographers on the site. I also showcase stylists and I also so showcase uh, directors. Um, so my focus really is in like entertainment, editorial, commercial photography. Um, I'm presenting a curated selection of black artists who I think are working, ready to work, um, are in transition to work um, because I'm dealing with clients who are ready to spend money. Um, so with all that said, the other component to Color Positive is that um, I've been mentoring for a very long time and uh, before launching, I really didn't want to just kind of take up real estate on the, on the web. So I decided to um, work with the same agency that I had been working with, which is Center for Supportive Schools. They have offices all over the United States in schools uh, where they have basically agents who help shape the curriculum um, for extracurricular activities. So I work with these agents and I bring a lot of the talent from the roster on the site to schools. Um, it's counseling, it's mentorship, um, it's just hearing kids out sometimes. Um, it's letting um, high school students know that they have opportunities to be in the arts and get paid um, and actually have a career doing it. Um, and then the third part of it is that uh, we do consult. Um, we do work with larger agencies uh, like Ogilvy. We make sure that um, we're not just focused on bringing in new talent, but again, a lot of talent that's been working, who just needs exposure, who needs the suggestion. We work um, getting those names out and making sure that they're on briefs when clients are looking for great talent to work with. How does your mentoring program work? Does it require that you physically are going to all these schools or that somebody from your organization can physically go to the schools to, in order to help them? Yeah, so that's been in transition, right? Because COVID has been a real game changer. But yes, that was that was the focus to be physically there. It's so important for these kids to see in front of them what the possibilities are, what their possibilities are. Um, so yeah, up until you know March, we were doing that, and then it stopped immediately. And ultimately, I have been working with many other authors here on this call to um, shape the industry in other ways, but also talking weekly to uh, coordinators and facilitators at high schools in New York and outside, uh, just about what they're doing, trying to be supportive in any way I can, but also remind them that um, they're in touch with me and that when they start to understand how their curriculum is going to develop, uh, that we can try and work something out that is going to be captivating and engaging, um, even though we're distant. And is it usually the school is set up to have these kind of programs? Is that, or do you go to the school and then uh, talk to them about setting up a program? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's actually, I try to make it as easy as possible. All high schools have some sort of, at the minimum, um, career day. Um, and then other high schools have um, programs that they've already built out. And then some are interested in creating something. Um, and we've done all three. Um, sometimes we just show up because we get a call. Hey, next Tuesday, this class really would love to meet someone that's going to inspire them. And I've helped provide that person. Uh, sometimes it's, hey, let's build a program for the next six months. We're coming in every other Friday. And I'm going to bring new talent in. Um, and it varies. But, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we just, we, we do whatever we can. You know, Great. we just trying to be able and ready. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a huge undertaking. So thank you. Um, uh, Jose Rivas, let's hear about uh, Native photographers and about your, your experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Native Photograph really started at, um, as a collaboration, to be honest. The, uh, Daniela Sagman, who's the co-founder or founder of Women's Photograph, um, and I decided to come together and 
really there were a lot of issues that, that we were talking about specifically around um, indigenous stories and who was telling those stories. Um, Daniela, she has a project where she photographs indigenous peoples and you know, we got into a conversation and, and really what it came down to is that um, one, there wasn't enough uh, indigenous storytellers, um, especially in, in the visual industry, you know, in the visual um, format that were telling these stories, but yeah, there were so many other stories. So we decided that we needed to gather as many people as possible that were already telling these this amazing stories in their community um, and put them together into a database, just like women's photograph. And that was really like, the, the basis of it was that it was that we wanted to make sure that if people were um, hiring, you know, non-Indigenous peoples to go tell the stories of Indigenous peoples, then we could show them something that they can refer to where they may have somebody in, in that community that they can do it as well. Um, and, you know, one of the big things in big, I guess, lessons that has come from this partnership uh, between me and Daniela is this conversation about who gets to tell the story, right? Like, does the outsider get to tell the story? Does the insider get to tell the story? And the beautiful part of it is that um, I think we're entering into a place where people are actually understanding the value of, especially indigenous peoples telling their own stories, then, then bringing somebody from the outside to tell that story. At the same time, we do need both. And I think that um, what, what Native Photograph is, is, is big on is bringing a balance to that, right? So. Right now, if you see a lot of stories about indigenous peoples, they're not being told by indigenous peoples. So we want to bring a balance to that and, mm -hmm. and also make sure that people understand the nuances of telling, you know, those stories in a way that, that are not perpetuating stereotypes or, or the same idea that we have about indigenous peoples. Um, so if you don't mind really quick, I wanted to share my screen. Here it is. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah I so can. <laughs> This is our website. Um, we have uh, not a humongous amount of people yet because we, you know, we go through a process of making sure everybody that's on the website um, has has a connection to their community and is really trying to tell a different story. But I wanted to share just a couple of, of our members. Um, Matika, Matika uh, Wilbur, she's um, has this amazing project called Project 562, and what the project is is basically. Um, documenting every single tribe in the United States um, for as, as long as it takes. And her work, it's not only nuanced, but it's, it's extremely important for the, you know, for the way that, that she tells the stories and the way that she brings in these narratives that have, you know, kind of romantic, been romanticized a little bit by the work of like, you know, Edward S. Curtis's and like, uh, I forgot Willie Nelson. No, no, it's not, it's not Willie Nelson. It's some other guy named Nelson um, who's from Europe who like, you know, has this idea that like native peoples are gonna be gone, so I have to go document them. Um, but she's saying, no, we're alive and we have communities and we're thriving and this is the story. So um, that's Matika, she's amazing. Uh, Taylor, she's another amazing photographer who um, just recently became a National Geographic Explorer, I believe. Um, her stories are very much rooted in indigenous matriarchs and the stories of you know, blood quantum and how a lot of these systems that were put up, uh, were put on indigenous peoples, uh, affect indigenous mm -hmm. peoples. Um, so I'll leave those, those two. And um, yeah, I think if people, you know, go to our website, at the moment we are in development in the sense that um, I think that there's a lot of big goals for the organization, um, but we're also taking our time and, and really understanding how to support our community uh, a lot better and also making sure that we're making that, that connection between the editors or the people that are telling stories about indigenous peoples and bring them back to, to those folks in our, in our database so that they can, in a way, uh, not only tell a new story of indigenous peoples, but it's also for us to be able to see indigenous peoples in a different light. Mm -hmm. And is this uh, international? Is it United States? Where, where are you going with this? Definitely. So right now we are focusing on what we call Turtle Island, which is also known as North America. So Canada, United States, Mexico, and parts of Central America. Um, and we have members throughout the, throughout the region. And the hope is that one day we, you know, we do go and connect with indigenous peoples of Australia, you know, indigenous peoples of Peru or Brazil. Uh, but at the moment we we're, we're still small. Um, and it's also, you know, it's, it's a, our organization is not, it's just run by two people basically. Um, 
So it's very much grassroots, but at the same time, there is a lot of, on the back end, you know, a lot of community that we're building within our members to be able to continue the conversations and really come up with solutions about, you know, a lot of these issues with the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, how, long is, how long have you had this site? It's been about two years. Three years, okay. About two years. Two years. And could you, um, one of the things that we were going to show, which when people come back, either they will add to the video that before it goes uh, onto the site or we'll post it on the APA national site, is to be able to see, you have the photos from your book and I, I would like if you could touch on your, um, on what the book that you did. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like a lot of different people that, that went to Stanin Rock, um, I personally was there as well, and a lot of us, you know, we were, we were, you know, we touched by, by the moment that we were living in, just like we are right now. And I think that for me, this this body of work of standing strong, um, it's, it's really in, you know, uh, a memory of, not only of the past, but it's like looking into the future, right? And looking into, one day, our, you know, our descendants are gonna look back at 2016 when, you know, people were fighting to protect the water of the Missouri River. And, and they're gonna look back at these images. And my hope is that they realize that, you know, their, their ancestors fought for that. And their, their ancestors uh, planted a seed that we're seeing, you know, uh, blooming right now, you know, with a lot of folks that were at Standing Rock are now fighting for us to have the right to have a, a good president in this country, you know, or the one that doesn't try to destroy the earth or also just being able to see like, you know, Ocasio-Cortez, being a standing rock and that's where she started her career as a politician. Um, so for me, these, these images are just, like I said, uh, memories, but also reminders of the power of indigenous peoples in not only in this country, but throughout the world. Right, and I would encourage people to go to your website. The, you have a, the book for sale on your site. You also did a TEDx talk um, at, in Rapid City about the, about the um, project, so definitely encourage people to take a look at that. Um, did you meet other photographers while you were covering it and have a conversation with them about how they were covering it? Yeah, I think that that's the root of it. That, that was the root of, you know, how, how I got ra radicalized to understand the industry because, you know, one of my mentors is a Magnum photographer. He was a standing rock. And, you know, when I went to him for for guidance and help, you know, I did see like this clash, right? Like he was this older man, photographer for Magnum, super established. And I was just kind of like, hey man, like, you know, if they tell you not to photograph, don't photograph. Like they're asking you not to do that. And he was like, no, but you know, but, but it's my right. And we had this conversation so long and um, he also helped me to understand the bigger picture in a way and um, told me to apply for like a fellowship at Magnum Foundation, which I ended up getting for the social justice program. And I think that what happened at Standing Rock with, with the, not even the clash, but it's really the, the merging of two different worldviews, um, which is like the Western worldview and also like the indigenous worldview, um, you know, kind of opened up that conversation within, yeah, within other photographers. And I think it's, it's like a conversation that is hard to have because I think a lot of folks are used to going to places where there's, you know, people of color and just like waltzing in and just staking as much as possible because it's their right. Um, but I'm hopeful that it will, you know, that will change a little bit. Mm -hmm. And are you thinking that on your website you'll um, you'll have information for people to follow um, as far as what to do when they're going to those places to photograph? Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. I, I just okay. missed your answer. My my little my son just came in. <laughs> Um, what, what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, uh, is there going to be also information on your site to um, suggest what people might do when they're going to those places uh, to cover the to cover that also like the, the conversation that you had? Do you have information on your site for other people to give them guidance about how to cover those events? Yeah, I think that um, at this point is more internal within the collective and within like our community because we don't really see our job to be educating people. Um, we, I think that it's the job of the people that need to be educated to go into those communities and, and seek that relationship that, that will allow them to better understand uh, those communities. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, 
Tara Pixley, if you could tell us about um, your background, it's uh, very impressive and I, I value hearing what you have to say. Um, thank you, Jillia, and thank you to everyone for being here with us today. It's always a joy and a pleasure to be with my esteemed colleagues. Um, speaking about the importance of diversity in photography. Uh, I'm Tara Pixley. I am a freelance visual journalist based in Los Angeles now, but I'm from Atlanta. I grew up in the Southeast and my family is uh, Jamaican. So I have this kind of, um, I'm a first generation American. So I, I care a lot about um, kind of immigrant issues and uh, recognizing the different uh, spaces and lived experiences and realities around immigration. And I'm currently working on a story about uh, Central American refugees and asylees who are waiting at the border, uh, the Mexican-American border in Tijuana to, uh, as they seek asylum. And I'm focusing on uh, kind of issues around that. What I care a lot about in my work is um, finding the the community that is happening around the different contemporary issues that we like to or, or that we typically tend to pay attention to as sort of tragedies and traumas and chaos so i like to draw attention to the sort of opportunities for community and caretaking and radical joy um just a little bit about my work and i am also a professor of journalism at loyola marymount university in los angeles and I'm here tonight in part to talk about my work with Authority Collective, where I'm one of the founding members. Authority Collective was founded in 2017, uh, and it's an organization of women and non-binary people of color working in photography, film, VR, and AR. We are very photographer heavy, uh, but love to have more people working in film and, and uh, immersive media. And what, what Authority Collective does is make we build community and opportunities we provide resources uh, and access for our particular group of women and non-binary uh, people in the industry people of color and we do a lot of different things we don't have a database like many of the the other organizations represented here today a lot of our work is focused around interventions around trying to reimagine what is possible in visual media, in photography industries, and trying to identify ways to um, make that access uh, to resources and to the industry itself possible for the for AC members, essentially. And we also work, it's not just for the 200 plus members and Authority Collective, the work that we do uh, while we build that community there. And we, of course, love to uh, provide opportunities for that community, we're really looking to in, enlarge what is possible for all people of color, for all uh, women and non-binary photographers and visual media makers in the industry. So uh, we do things such as working with organizations and different collaborations, uh, like our um, most recent really big project was the Guide to Inclusive Photography, a guidebook to inclusive photography that we uh, wrote and edited with Photo Shelter, and I will post a link to that in the chat so that you all can take a look at it later. But that's sort of a, um, a guidebook that walks you through different things to think about as you're photographing Black and Brown people, Indigenous communities, people from the Global South, how to think about representational issues around communities like the LGBTQIA communities, and and really just trying to get at how do we how do we get away from extractive practices in our photography how do we represent communities and individuals with care and being incredibly conscientious for the the power hierarchies at play in the photographer photographed relationship um, and we also do work like the we do exhibits. We've frequently exhibited um, uh, show, photo shows at Photo Shelter LA and Photo Shelter New York, in New York City. And we do the Lit List, which is a really wonderful project started by Oriana Karen, also one of our founding members. And that is an award that highlights 30 of the, the best photographers of color to watch and hire and keep track of as they uh, do amazing work in the industry. So we have quite a lot going on all the time. And I 
look forward to being able to talk a little bit more about that as we go through tonight's discussion. And when did when were these guidelines written? So the guidebook premiered in late May. We'd actually been working on it um, with Photo Shelter since December of 2019, and it really kicked off <laughs> right after COVID started. Uh, and we have some really wonderful uh, photographers who are able to contribute to that, such as Hannah Reyes Morales, Leila Amatula Barrain, and uh, Taylor Irvine, who Josue was speaking about earlier, incredible photographers, all of them. Mongwen Sao, Javel Tamayo, and Danielle Viasana were all of the writers on the project. Uh, also offering their images in conjunction with writing in the guidebook. And I edited the guidebook. Um, we do a lot of these kinds of projects where we reach out to collaborate with different organizations and see what sorts of things they might be interested in or and vice versa. And some really wonderful things have come out of that. We're currently working with the um, National Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta and Atlanta Celebrates Photography to put on an exhibit of imagery around human rights issues from Authority Collective members. So that'll be coming next month. That's fantastic. Do you do workshops? We do. We've been thinking a lot about what webinars and such things might be useful to do. And I think, you know, right now there's a lot of, um, there are so many different opportunities for workshops and webinars online, which is amazing because we have this, you know, the one benefit I would say of our current global predicament is the accessibility now of people to one another. It, you know, many of us on this panel right now might not have been able to speak together in the room in Palm Springs, but we can be brought together because of, of this particular kind of format and interface. And so the opportunities there abound, but we also want to be very thoughtful about uh, how we're curating what we present to the community. And, and women photograph, um, Diversify Photo, Everyday Projects are all doing really incredible work and offering really incredible workshops. So we're still sort of thinking through what, to, what best to sort of offer uh, the community and currently are focusing more on community kind of, uh, not happy hours, but like community care talks and spaces for us to all kind of get together, um, those, the AC members and just support one another through these kind of, uh, you know, through the emotional <laughs> and uh, various distresses represented by the pandemic and the, the um, racial justice movement going on. Yeah, and I would encourage people to go because they might be watching us on Facebook or later on Authority Collective website. You have a link to the photo shelter guide there as well. Yes, I would love it if you checked it out and downloaded it. It's free. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Andrea Weiss? Hi, um, I'm Andrea. I am a independent photo editor um, currently on contract at National Geographic on the history and culture desk. And in 2017, I co-founded Diversify Photo with Brent Lewis, who is an amazing partner in this journey and a photo editor at the New York Times. Um, and Brent and I actually did not know each other before we started working on this little project of ours. Um, we both, um, I think, really responded a lot to what Daniela Zalkman did when she launched Women Photograph um, and both started having a lot of conversations with different photographers and we're having a lot of conversations with fellow photo editors um, and, you know, about disparities in hiring practices in photography. And, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up when you talk with other photo editors is that it's it's a barrier to diversifying your rosters when you're reliant on certain um, traditional structures within the photo community. So things like, you know, workshops that cost a lot of money um, or, you know, conferences that take place in New York City or in other expensive destinations that not everybody can afford to like take off work or travel to, um, universities with high tuition, all of these types of um, networks that already are not very diverse. And then by being a member of those networks, you get a leg up in your career. And those are just um, ways that kind of perpetuate the opportunity gap. But when you when you have access to those networks, you get, you know, FaceTime or I guess now 
virtual FaceTime with photo editors. And that's a really, really powerful thing for building trust and for, you know, just getting on people's radar. So we wanted to address that and um, we do have a database. So we started with a spreadsheet of 300 photographers of color across the US. Um, we wanted our spreadsheet to be as useful as possible for photo editors. So it was really important to us from the start um, to be a vetted list. Um, we wanted to sort of replicate the idea of like calling up your friend who's also a photo editor and being like hey I need somebody in you know Wichita like who do you recommend um, and feeling like you can trust that person because that photographer has been you know vetted and um, and you know somebody that you trust has has vouched for them um, so we we uh, our like inaugural class um, of members was vetted by volunteer editors at places like National Geographic, the New York Times, AARP, Washington Post. Um, and last year we were able to grow after we brought on two more amazing members to our team, David Beretta, who is a, our digital producer, and Salgu Wismath, who is our communications manager. Um, and since bringing them on, we've been able to like offer a lot more opportunities. Um, we've expanded internationally. Now we have almost 700 members across the world um, and have also um, recognized that there were a lot of folks who weren't quite at the level that we, we felt comfortable offering full membership to, but who, you know, might really benefit from internships or from assisting other photographers or from other kinds of early career opportunities. And we wanted to support them and help them get to the level of like full membership and of, you know, being really competitive out there on the marketplace. So we added a class that we're calling the Next Up Photographers, um, and that's also on our website. And I recommend checking that out. Um, you know, those are folks that we think are really worth just keeping an extra eye on. Um, and we've been kind of from the start trying to um, just address the various barriers that keep photographers of color and photographers from various, um, you know, traditionally marginalized groups from having the same access to opportunities as everyone else. Um, and so we do things like um, an annual holiday print sale that um, we share the revenue from, uh, we cover all the costs and share the revenue with our, with the photographers 50-50. Um, we do a lot of community building things. Um, we get a lot of requests for speaking opportunities for exhibitions, for panels, and we try like whenever it's possible to divert those things to various members. So just getting people's, like raising people's uh, profile. I think sometimes, even with you know talks like this, we kind of underestimate just how much of a like profile boost and how much of a credibility boost it is to be you know featured as a speaker and be presented as an authority on a various topic. So um, that's something that we prioritize. Um, when COVID hit, we were able to raise close to twenty thousand dollars in COVID relief, and that allowed us to also run a grant with the Pulitzer Center, um, and we'll be announcing three winners later this week. They're fantastic stories and I wish I could talk about them right now. Um, and then we are also are partnering with Fujifilm um, to produce professional development workshops at Photoville. Our first session was this past Friday. The second session is this Friday and the third session will be next Friday. Um, and we review new applicants on a rolling basis. So you can find us at diversifyphoto.com. It took us like I think two years to get the dot com, but now it's dot com. Wow, that's amazing. And then the money you raised, are you raising that from individuals or are you going to corporations to raise money? Um, it started completely from individuals. So like our COVID relief um, fund, we started as a print sale where um, we were, you know, send us images and we will handle like the order fulfillment, the transactions, the printing, shipping and everything. Um, and we would just direct 100% of your sales right back to you. Um, and then we were getting a lot of just like general donations that we didn't really expect and know what to do with. Um, and so those are, that's the fun funding that we then brought to the Pulitzer Center for the grant. Um, but all of that, that 20,000 was entirely from individuals. We have just started um, 
gently suggesting that photo editors who use our list regularly make contributions to just keeping our you know operations going because it is a ton of work. Um, so there's a lot of really generous editors, including some that I see on the participants list now that I do see PayPaling us money every now and then, which is really really cool. Um, and then, you know, obviously Fujifilm um, contributed a, a substantial amount of money for us to be able to produce our workshops, which is awesome because it means that we can pay all of the speakers who are part of our workshop and also pay our producer to, you know, put in the labor. So, um, yeah, mostly it's from individuals. And the people who are behind Diversify Photo, are those, is everybody a volunteer? Yes, we are all volunteers, although, um, like, Salgu is producing the workshop um, and because we had funding for that, we're able to pay them. Um, and yeah, we've been able to kind of give ourselves a little bit of money every now and then, but um, for the most part, it's entirely volunteer. I wanna change that though, cause um, I just like, you know, to the extent that, um, that those of us who have jobs have jobs or, you know, I'm on contract, but like right now I'm, financially fine because of that. So like, I'm more than happy to be um, volunteering my time. But I, I do just, you know, like Polly and others on this call have mentioned, like a lot of this work ends up just being volunteer and that's a ton of work. Um, and so I really do think that like for the sustainability of these efforts, um, we have to figure out ways to not feel bad about paying ourselves, but I'm still working on how exactly yeah. to do that. So thank you. So um, five out of six of you are co-authors on the Photo Bill of Rights. Um, you're all signers on the Photo Bill of Rights. And I would really like um, if you could talk a little bit about how that came together. There is a lot of people who, who are, have been involved in it, who are all listed on the site. Um, and uh, I'd really love to hear about what the process was on that and how long it took to put together. And, what what do you see happening with that? Andrea, you want to go? No, I was going to say Tara, you want to go? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so back in late March, um, I'm going to bring up Oriana again. Oriana is wonderful for ideas. Um, they reached out to a few of us, um, myself, Andrea, I believe Josue, um, and several other people who became part of the, the Photo Bill of Rights author team. And the idea was just kind of like, we should write an open letter about how photographers are being affected by COVID and how this is really laying bare the, system, the systemic inequality and um, kind of financial precarity that so many people in our industry face all the time and also bringing attention to the issues that we have all individually and, and collectively through our organization have been trying to draw attention to that the most marginalized are in the most precarious situations and not receiving the kind of support and recognition and validation from the industry that they deserve and now COVID is kind of decimating those people's um, careers and financial stability and as we talked about it we kept bringing on more people um, people that we knew were like down for the cause and that would be great voices in the group and it eventually became a an author uh, kind of an author crew of I believe 16 or 17 individuals which represented um, eight organizations I might have I might be off by one okay Peter just give me thumbs up all right um, and then we really just it, it just grew and grew and grew as we started to write down what we wanted to ask of the industry we started thinking about so many different things and having that much input from different perspectives brought attention to a lot of um, like things like maternal wall bias that which i actually never heard of until we started talking about all of these issues that people are experiencing and i'm a mother i've actually struggled with being a parent in the photo industry and didn't even have the words to describe those struggles until i was with this group speaking to them about um, all the different issues that we individually and and we know that um, our peers and colleagues are experiencing so it really just grew from there and I'll, I'll let other people jump in so i'm not taking up too much space about the process but we ultimately launched in june 
on June 22nd. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll don't everybody jump in at once here. Um, I'll, I'll add a little bit. I mean, um, yeah, so I mean, we launched June 22nd. It was, it was very important for us to launch not only, I mean, the Bill of Rights, you know, functions as exactly that, as a, as a list of what we feel are the rights that um, photographers and beyond that with the term that we eventually uh, decided on was lens-based workers. Um, you know, the rights that as workers that, that should be, you know, uh, uh, uniform to that field. Um, but beyond that, <clears throat> and you can, um, you know, check this out on the website, it's all there, but we, we didn't want to just sort of leave it as that as, okay, you sign this and, and you know, you move on. Um, there are a number of toolkits there. There are toolkits for, um, for lens-based workers to use. Um, there are toolkits for editor, editors to use. Um, there's more content coming out. Um, but those toolkits include things like, um, you know, our suggestions for, uh, for fostering a more inclusive uh, community. Um, uh, suggestions for, or, or even templates for how to negotiate, uh, you know, prices and, and like literal email templates that you can talk to, use to talk about rates with editors and things like that. I mean, getting back to Andrea talking about how we, we should be paid um, for the work that we do and should not be afraid to advocate for ourselves. Um, and then on the editor side, uh, you know, it included elements of um, how to have these difficult conversations at work, in the workplace, with other editors, other, you know, parts of your news organization or, or whatever organization, um, as well as, you know, the things that you should be advocating for, for your photographers that you're hiring, safety, um, you know, fair pay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there are bound to be things that I'm missing because there's a lot there, but we wanted those to be, um, while the bill is, a, is, is, you know, a sort of finished document, we wanted the, the other elements to be living documents that people can utilize, people can give feedback on, and they are things that we're going to be um, creating more of in the future. So um, a couple of uh, points were brought up when it, when it first launched and there was a lot of discussion and I'm sure you've seen a lot of discussion on, on different Facebook groups and, and people discussing it. Um, there were questions about some of the guidelines and understanding signing onto the statement, which is um, not a living document from what I understand. So that you're signing onto the statement and then guidelines and whether or not if you were signing on, did that mean that all those guidelines were things that everybody who's signing on would follow or whether or not those were just suggestions and people would take what they want from them. So in, in one of the items, um, there was a question about informed consent and asking somebody, um, and Jose, you brought this up earlier about asking permission or when is it appropriate to photograph uh, people in at protest or if there's looters. Is there, are there situations where a photojournalist should be asking permission before they're taking a picture or before they post a photo? And what is that relationship? And what are the guidelines that uh, the Photo Bill of Rights is suggesting? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, can, I can share something about not specifically the photo bill of rights, but my personal practice in how the photo bill of rights reinforces that. Um, when, you know, like going back to the Sending Rock conversation, when I saw how many people were coming in to Sending Rock from, from like New York and different places. And again, that, you know, that almost like attitude and culture behind, you know, photojournalism being like, this is my story to tell, like this is my right, you know. Um, I think that when, when I think about the photo bill of rights to, to me personally, in my practice, it applies to your relationship and your intention behind doing what you're doing. So it's like, are you going out there to, to take and you know, parachute and take something from that community or even from that story? Or are you going there to serve? And I think that we are um, living in a moment in this industry where we are like, 20 years behind, you know, and, and 
and pretty quickly we've been asked to hurry up because the new paradigm and the new way of being on this earth is not going to be extractive. It's going to be one that it's matriarchal and that it gives before it takes. So I think that this this whole idea of consent and it's just it's, to me it's just like basic manners. Like what we did in the land acknowledgement, that's basic manners. When you go to somebody else's home that is it's not your traditional home, you just ask for permission and say, hey, I'm here. Can um, can I come in? And I think that this idea of consent is it's you know it's been like spun a little bit. And from what I've seen, I really don't get into the drama of Facebook because I don't really have time for that. But I've seen some stuff um, where like older photographers are like freaking out because um, they think that you know these new kids are coming in with you know with their new ways. And it's really like what you focus on. You know, if you really understand that that what we're talking about is what you've been doing is just in a different language and it's a different words, then you should have no problem with it. Um, and I think that that's why it's going to be hard to digest for a lot of people because a lot of people are still vibrating at a certain vibration that they think that, you know, photojournalism is about taking and that that is the paradigm is let's go to Africa, photograph some kids, win a Pulitzer Prize, and then get recognition for taking. And I think that we're being asked to give, if that makes any sense. So when you're out there, you're, you know, you're photographing, even here in Portland, I've been photographing the protest. You know, there's times when I don't photograph at all because I know that as a storyteller, what I'm trying to say in the voice that, that I'm trying to amplify, um, that's another story that I want to amplify and it's not, it's just in a line. And so why am I even there? So then I go home. You know, but there's things that are centered around black lives, for example, and there's like, you know, so much activism happening in, in the city about Black Lives Matter that nobody even documents. Then I'm going to go try it and see if I can support that. So I think it's, it's, it's just a different paradigm. And I think that's why people have a hard time with it. And my hope is that people realize that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting seeing some of the response because um, I really don't think fundamentally nothing that we're talking about is really a new concept. I mean, photojournalism has always to a certain extent emphasized the need for consent and the knowledge for people to know that that they're being photographed. And we've done that in different ways. I mean, as an editor, I expect names and contact information for pretty much anybody that a photographer photographs. Um, and that's always been a, a really normal part of, um, of our practice. It's part of the journalism side of photojournalism. Um, so I think some of like what, what we've done um, is also just responding to the changing nature of the industry where um, a lot of the pathways for professional development for getting into the field um, that used to be, you know, studying photojournalism in school, then having an internship, maybe at a small paper, working really closely with photo editors, then maybe having an internship at a bigger paper, then maybe getting a staff job at a small paper, and then a bigger paper, and then freelancing for national outlets. And a lot of those, that like pipeline of training is gone. Um, and so there's a lot of photographers who are just going straight into freelancing and haven't had that same education that you know 10 years ago you might have had on the job um, and a lot of you know photographers who are working without I mean the the photographer photo editor relationship is really really different now than it used to be um, so yeah I think Josue is absolutely right that like we might be using slightly different language for discussing some of this stuff but it's also not really um, anything new I want to um, back off of what you were saying. Oh, sorry, what were you saying, Tara? Or... No, it's okay. Go ahead, Polly. <laughs> no, I mean, I want to echo what both of the, what they were saying. Um, as someone who just signed on as an organization, because fortunately as being the only one, I just have to check in with myself and see if this makes sense. <laughs> and so for me, I think it was really important to really sign on though, but, but picking back of what Andrea said, I mean, I graduated from the University of Oregon three years ago. And when I was studying, my major was journalism. Um, I applied for every photo internship that you could think of, fellowship, everything, and nothing. You know, luckily I was able to find internships within social media, within news. And so that's where my path led me. And everything I've done with my photography has been outside of that. 
if it wasn't for organizations like NABJ, which is the National Association of Black Journalists, Women Photograph, Diversify Photo, and et cetera. Like if it wasn't for these organizations and seeing you know, people doing the work, people in these fields, then I probably wouldn't be here talking to you because I didn't see a road for me for photography. I didn't have editors or connections within the industry. You know, I, I grew up um, in Kansas and then I went to a PWI. And so I didn't know any other black photographers, let alone black women photographers. And so, you know, what everything that she was saying, there is no traditional path. There's no, you just graduated, welcome. Here's everything you need to know and here's what you need to do. And here are the rules in the industry. There is none of that. It really is just navigating the space that, you know, it's a very wide space. So I won't have to preach to you all because I feel like everyone here knows that. It's a very white male dominated industry. And so, you know, having these organizations, but let alone this, you know, blueprint, um, it's really important. I mean, for me, I just really feel like it's everything that people have been whispering about that they just said out loud. You know, everyone has been whispering about everything that's been mentioned in the photo bill of rights. But now <laughs> we're no longer whispering. They are no longer whispering. And so for me, I just think it's really important that if we're gonna do this work, if we're gonna have these conversations, we need to be okay with being uncomfortable. You need to <laughs> check yourself and your privileges and wonder why, you know, why am I uncomfortable? Why is it is it this or that? Or you know, really just have those internal conversations with yourself or whoever, your organizations, to realize what is the holdup. I mean, for me, I just, I'm just i just glad they did the work, the long, long intensive labor work to provide this resource for, you know, lens-based workers for myself, the organization, and just, you know, the industry at large. Yeah, I um, totally agree with all of those perspectives and also wanted to add that I think it's really important to understand that informed consent, that whole concept is just a part, it's actually a small part, I would say, of the larger idea of minimizing harm when we're photographing, when we're filming, when we're doing any kind of documentary work or storytelling with communities. Because for a long time, um, you know, like Josue was saying, photojournalism has been tied to taking to those extractive practices. And it was the people who were in positions of power and privilege who were never really thinking about um, the responsibility that they have, that it is a privilege for us to be able to go into people's lives, into their communities, for to often be photographing and documenting the worst things that have ever happened to them, or, you know, a fight for a struggle for their livelihood, for their survival, for their lives. And when we're doing that work, we can't imagine ourselves as entitled to someone's story. If we're going out into, you know, spaces of protest, conflict zones, spaces where people are um, fleeing violence and, you know, again, in, in having the worst experience of their lives, then we need to be humble. We need to acknowledge ourselves as in service to telling this story. And I think for a long time, photojournalism has focused on the audience. You know, the audience is what we're working for. And so we can do all of these kind of heinous things uh, to the people that we're photographing and you know invalidate their their feelings invalidate their experiences and it's all fine because we're doing it in service to the greater good of educating the audience but really that it's a completely wrong headed way to approach our jobs and it it doesn't make sense it's illogical right if we if we imagine ourselves as um, being public servants as educating the audience as like doing this work of bringing attention to um, the you know the worst problems of our day to human rights violations and civil rights violations why is it okay to take from the people who are being harmed the most by the thing who are experiencing those civil and human rights violations we're taking from them and photographing them we're not considering the harm we might be causing and we're just telling ourselves it's fine because we need to educate some people you know back home or down the street so we need to have the same kind of concept of care towards the people that we are photographing as we imagine that we have towards the the audiences that we are photographing for like at the end of the day we are photographing for the people in our images the people whose stories uh, we're allowed to tell that they're letting us tell so a simple thing like asking someone or or you know just saying hi i'm tara i'm here photographing this for 
you know, this publication. And I just wanted to let you know that I took this photo and it'll be here. I, I've said that over and over and over and over and over again at protests. And I've had exactly one person ask me not to, to show their image, to show their face. And so I'm not losing anything. The audience isn't losing anything. We're gaining something because I'm inspiring a sense of trust and community with the people I'm photographing. And I hope that it's helping to put a better face on journalists because frankly, we don't look great <laughs> out there these days. Like the way those extractive practices, people are noticing it, the public is noticing it. And the trust in journalism is being eradicated, not just from outside forces like our politicians and American administration. It's also being eradicated by the journalists themselves who, um, who aren't taking that time and that care and being conscientious in our approaches to the people that we photograph. And so that's what informed consent is about. That's what minimizing harm is about, is being in community and recognizing ourselves as public servants and recognizing the importance of um, uh, the privilege, again, of being able to photograph and tell people's stories. So in a lead in to that, could you, uh, one of you explain male gaze or Western male gaze, because that is something that's brought up in, in the um, guidelines. Yeah, one, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, one of the things that I'm really proud of that we did is we put together a glossary because um, we recognize that a lot of the concepts and terms that we use um, might be new to some people. So um, there, it's actually, I think it's at uh, photobillofrights.com slash glossary. Um, and yeah, so the male gaze, ah, where's my Zoom box? Okay, <laughs> the male gaze um, is a concept from film theory um, that's been around for a really long time that basically um, women are uh, and have been um, portrayed through the vantage point of men um, and have um, been historically um, sexualized and objectified from that vantage point. So it's that's not a concept that we made up. That's just something that's like very well documented. Um, the Western male gaze, um, and I think the phrase that we use in the, in the photo bill of rights is talking about the white Western cisgender male gaze, which is just getting really specific at the vantage point that the majority, the vast majority of photojournalism has come from historically. Um, and that, you know, in order to recognize the way that we're, we're representing various communities, we also have to rep recognize the way that the work that we produce now sits in a historical context. Yeah, can, can I just add to that a little bit, um, <clears throat> you know, because I know that that's been, um, you know, some of the terminology that people have, you know, taken issue with as far as looking at the Bill of Rights. Um, and um, I, I, I just feel like it's very important to say, and for me as a white man to say it, that when we talk about sort of going beyond the, the white male gaze, going beyond the male gaze, um, going beyond the Western gaze. And, you know, we even in the Bill of Rights, uh, we're not afraid to use the term white supremacy. Um, you know, it's important for me as a white man to, to talk about this. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, this is not a, I think some of the reaction in that I've seen in, in sort of Facebook discussions, et cetera, I mean, like, like Josue, I, I try not to look at it too much because it's not a productive place for conversation and it is a time suck. Um, but some of the reactions that I've seen have been essentially a, a, a not all men kind of reaction. And I've, I've literally seen some people pay, uh, commenting saying, not all white men are bad. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that that's, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying all white men are bad. All white men should step down from their positions as photographers, et cetera. Um, but what we are saying is that um, it is up to everyone to dismantle these systems and these, you know, these traditional legacies of uh, white supremacy and uh, this sort of Western oriented gaze on the world that that photojournalism um, perpetuates. Um, 
you know, in, in, I mean, someone earlier mentioned discomfort. I think Paul, he mentioned discomfort. I mean, being a, a white American man that started a project that is, you know, about sort of redefining how we look at Africa. I, I mean, it's, it's just been nonstop discomfort for me. Um, you know, but I mean, you lean into it and, you know, you sort of recognize the, the good that you can do and the changes that you can make and the ally that you can be. And it's, you know, it, I think just, I think it's very important for all of us to, to be a part of uh, together, so. Yeah, I just want to jump in and also, I th Peter, I think you're so right. And also with Andrea before, you know, I think the history part, of, the history component is so important. When we start having these conversations, a lot of the times there's conflict in these types of scenarios, even with old language or information that's not that new, is because, you know, the education is not great. Um, a lot of the things that we're talking about in the Bill of Rights, I'd say most of it, if not all, um, you know, the Black community, Native Americans, Asian community, like all, all marginalized communities have been asking for these things, for these rights, especially in journalism, since the early 1800s. And that's documented. Um, so I think the context and to understand really how far back this goes, you know, most people don't have that understanding. So like, it's, it's also part of sort of coming in together to really Again, educate each other, educate yourself on what you're stepping into when you make the choice to work in this field. And what is your goal? Who do you see signing on in particular? Are you, is it in particular photographers or the publishing companies or advertising companies? Who, who ideally, when you wrote it, you thought it would be great if these people signed on? I think we we felt it would be great if people read the Bill of Rights and thought, oh, here's some guidelines that I could like actually institute in my, you know, my my work, my institution. Like, it, it definitely isn't about signatories. You know, it's it's about having a space where people can go and see that they're not alone and feeling like they deserve to get paid on time, that they're not alone and feeling like there are some issues in the industry and they're, they're not alone in all of the different struggles that they've been experiencing throughout their career as they try to make it in as a lens space worker. So yes, like we wanted, we wanted the New York Times to sign on. We want ad agencies to sign on. We want you know, Joe Schmo to sign on. We want anyone who cares about creating a better tomorrow and making today possible for everyone to come to the table and do this work and have a visual perspective in our media. We want all of those people to, you know, sign on. But at, it really isn't about the signing. It's about the doing the work and wrestling with the things that, you know, wrestling with that discomfort. I think that's one of the best things that we could take away from this is that we all have to be uncomfortable so that we can actually progress. And um, reading through the Bill of Rights and identifying spaces where we can each do better, I think is the ultimate goal from my perspective. I don't want to speak for everyone else. But. And do you see some that there are people who are going to contact you who need help, who read this and say, I need help getting paid, I need help in a different way. Is there a support system within the photo bill of rights or do you see that more from the various associations that you've all started? I mean, I think part of why we wrote this is because those are things that um, all of us that our various communities have been coming to us for a while, like for years, um, Brent and I have had, I mean, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but for years, Brent and I have had photographers say, hey, X publication, you know, hasn't paid me for, it's been like 90 days past invoicing. Do you have any ideas? And, um, and some of just what we've done um, kind of organically has been like, you know, hey, I'm a freelancer. Here's the strat. Here are the strategies that have worked for me for getting invoices paid. Like here are, you know, here's the freelance isn't free act. Like here's things that we know just from being in this field and operating and running our businesses and like trying to survive. 
And so all of us have been doing that in an informal way. Um, and that's part of like what Polly was saying. These are all things that have been whispered for a long time and we wanted to just put it out there. So now like if anybody on this call has any outstanding invoices, like we have email templates for how to like kindly request that your invoices get paid. Um, but having said that, um, the photo bill of rights as a organization or as a, you know, coalition of organizations, we are not, um, like policing the industry. We are not like chasing down photographers invoices for them. But what we do want is for photographers to feel like they are now better equipped to know what they can ask for. I mean, that's something that I definitely have experienced in a lot of um, the places that I've worked is just like photographers not asking for what they should be asking for. And me sometimes, depending on where I'm working, having to be like, hey, by the way, we also pay X or like, hey, you can charge us for, you know, your gear rental, um, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think the other big component is also just the community realizing that it's much bigger than they, they think and that they're not alone um, and that we're all going through a lot of similar things on various different levels coming in, having been a professional for 20 years and everything in between. Um, I think it, it was also just a part of kind of creating a space and the language for us to kind of understand what was all happening between us and to us. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, one question, um, and I feel like you've basically answered it already, and it's how is the Bill of Rights being received by those that hire photographers? Um, is, is, do, you, do you all feel like you already have kind of addressed that, or is there anything more to add to that? Well, I, yeah, I was, I was reading that and, and thinking about the question, and I could just add a little bit to it, which has been... Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversations. We actually did a, a, a private webinar that was like a photo editor salon a few weeks ago um, and, and just a lot of back and forth uh, conversations beyond that. Um, as you can imagine, as it gets to larger companies, it becomes harder for them to officially like sign on because their legal departments get involved and blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, a lot of the companies have, you know, their editors and staff photographers, et cetera, have been able to sign on. Um, and, you know, and we've just had, you know, it varies from publication to publication or client to client, but we've had a lot of uh, positive conversations with people who, who want to sort of, you know, use the Bill of Rights to integrate changes in their organization. And so we're trying to help where we can to, to facilitate that happening. I also think it's, you know, something that is useful about the Photo Bill of Rights is that while it would be great for larger institutions to sign on, it makes it possible for photo editors, for people who are working in those institutions but don't have a lot of power and say, you know, typically when I don't get paid on time, I don't get mad at the photo editor. They're not in charge of, you know, the budget <laughs> and, or, or they might be in charge of the budget, but they're not in charge of paying me typically for much larger institutions. That's happening at a higher level where they're setting their, their net 60, net 90, net, you know, whatever. And to have, to be able to say, hey, look, 2,500 people in the industry signed this document asking for being paid on time. And it looks like a lot of people think that that needs to happen. And also there's all these rationales for how not paying people on time actually keeps certain people out of the industry. So the I saw another question in the Q&A about conversations ha we've had with traditional clients, publishers, et cetera, around the issues of marginalized voices. And I think a lot of times it's like, we need more diversity and, and people agree, but they don't know what that means. They don't actually understand all of the different things that keep diverse voices and, and um, you know, perspectives out of our industries. And one of the biggest things for freelancing lens-based workers is that we have to front load all of our expenses. You have to have thousands of dollars of equipment. You have to travel, you have to hire people, photo assistants and all these things. And then if people aren't paying you for months, then that comes out of your pocket. And, you know, I have been independent since I was 18 years old. No one has ever helped me buy a single piece of equipment. So everything comes out of my pocket and what I can make happen for myself. And when you're dealing with people in the industry who have different privileges, different financial realities, and come from different, you know, socioeconomic statuses. They don't often think about 
the privilege that they have to have access to those resources. And if they just keep doing it and think it's fine and they're not demanding that they get paid on time because they don't have to worry about charging up their credit card because they have, they come from money or privilege, of, you know, whatever, then the industry isn't paying attention to all of the marginalized people who don't come from those privileges, who don't have the, the access to resources like that and who are going into debt just to do their job. So, I think one of the things the Photo Bill of Rights does is call attention to those um, those often invisible uh, aspects of our job that we all just kind of do and stay quiet about because we feel like we have to in order to remain in the industry and to keep getting called for jobs. I can tell you right now there's at least 14 people in the directory for Black women photographers that have been renting equipment just to get their work done. And you want to know that based on their portfolio or their talent and their skills. But to her point, it's just we do what we have to do because we have no other choice. And I know a lot of people who are here relate to that or are watching can relate to that. Um, and I think that's one thing that's so key is just that fact that there's so many different resources. And I think I think I see one of the panelists, Alexis Hunley, she's a part of some of these organizations. Uh, sorry, not a panelist, participants. Sorry to put you on the spot, Alexis. <laughs> um, but I saw your name earlier. And so she's, you know, she's in some of these organizations. And she even had to create a, a, a form that's similar to some of the resources within the Bill of Rights of just not being exploited during these, this time. A lot of these brands, a lot of these outlets, um, some of, you know, some who may be on this call right now have been reaching out to marginalized voices, Black photographers in particular, during this moment and trying to, you know, exploit them for just this moment for saying, okay, I have this opportunity, you know, disguised an opportunity, I should say, um, and I'll pay you this, when really it's just an offensive amount or nothing at all. Um, and so, you know, part of the Photo Bill of Rights, it gives us the tools um, to really just say, hey, <laughs> sorry, but no, no, sorry, but no thanks kind of thing. Um, because oftentimes, like, at least for myself, advocating for yourself, you know, is something that you have to just learn the hard way. Um, because there is no one who will do that for you. And unless for now, there's this, but before that, you know, it's really just hard because you're in this industry. And you feel like if you don't say yes, if you don't do this, if you know, all these different things, you never know when the next quote unquote opportunity may come, you know, you feel that pressure to do whatever it takes to just say yes to everything, regardless how harmful it is to yourself. And then also just the greater, you know, uh, understanding of like of photographers, you know, you don't want to cut anybody else just because you said yes to something that you shouldn't have, um, but you just don't know until you hear, until you, you know, you learn from the perspectives of people like on the panel um, or other photographers because I know for sure that the black and brown photographers have really have had my back, have really had told me, hey, actually, you know, maybe you should read that contract again. Maybe you should, you know, and it, we just have to learn from each other or resources like this because it's been so hush hush and it really shouldn't be like that in this industry. So I can just add to, to that and something that came up to my mind really quickly when you were talking about like the whole idea of like lens-based workers, uh, it was it was that we're actually, you know, looking back in retrospect to the beginning of the photo bill of rights, to me it felt like we were rewriting a language and and um and thinking of the future. You know, like I was saying earlier, um, you know, sometimes it's uncomfortable to learn a new language, right? Like some folks might feel like, you know, it's not for them or that it's too radical, you know, in comparison to their language. And I think that at the you know at the foundation of a lot of these problems that we're trying to tackle with our individual individual organizations and the photo bill of rights is we're trying to tackle settler colonialism and we all are part of that you know and when we ask folks that are a little more privileged or that have had a certain paradigm to to rethink it it's because we're not saying hey you're the problem and your ancestors did this to my people we're saying your job is to dismantle that system that you benefit from because because that's, that's how we bring equality or equity into our society and i also think that you know the bill of rights is this is this seed that if we keep watering it which i know for a fact that the people that are involved in it will do it one way or another but we need more people than that we need 
you know, in 10 years, when we look back at 2020 and the industry looks back at 2020, realizing that, you know, doing groups like this for diversity and, you know, inclusion is not just a thing that you do just because, you know, Black Lives Matter is happening. It's because that's how it should be done. We should be dismantling colonialism every single day. And I think that, you know, as we enter this new place where we're gonna be in, you know, as we are in it right now, where we are being asked to go beyond our fears and to, you know, to tap into the love that we have for the things that we do. Like, for example, for us to tell stories and to shape the reality of humanity. I really think that that's, that is at the bottom of it. It's like, we, are, we have to learn a new language and taking and shooting and capturing and subjecting. If we continue to use those words, those are tiny little things that are programmed in our mind every single day. So we can use the words like collaboration or making something with somebody, or I'm gonna go document, you know? I really think that all those things matter and we sometimes forget in this industry that those things matter and we just allow, you know, the colonizing ways to continue to run our industry. Well, can, I, can I just add one very, very quick point? Mm -hmm which is um, just that something that I feel like is often lost in these conversations is um, that this is not just something that like we should do because like morally it's the right thing to do or because, you know, it's just about fairness. I mean, it is all of those things, but also it's about what is our ultimate goal when we produce photography and especially when we produce photojournalism and we can't produce accurate and insightful and nuanced photojournalism unless the people who are telling those stories are as informed as possible about the issues that they're reporting on. Um, and so in talking about um, using, you know, diversifying photojournalism and and cultivating those voices and you know making this a field where anybody can compete and anybody can like financially survive and have a viable business and like cultivate their skills as journalists that that's ultimately about producing more accurate and more insightful and more engaging um journalism thank you that really says everything there. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we need to wrap up. APA is coming on at 630, um, which is one minute from now. So I'm going to have to jump over to that webinar. There's uh, webinars taking place. APA is on at 630 every night this week. We're going to be introducing board members. Wednesday, we're going to be introducing our diversity committee. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking with celebrity photographers. Thursday, with uh, working on a safe set. Um, but to, we're going to send the link with the, um, or the video that I had wanted to show you. I'm going to send it to the Palm Springs Photo Festival so that they can add it before they post this uh, as a video that'll be up on the site all week that people can access. And um, I encourage you to go, go to all the websites of the panelists who are here and their groups and you can go to the Photo Bill of Rights, read about it, and follow the links there to all the different groups. That's how I found them to participate today. And I really appreciate their, again, joining on such short notice and pulling this together. I think this is an important conversation and we look forward to continuing to have it. Um, American Photographic Artists, APA, APAnational.org. We've signed on to the Photo Bill of Rights. Palm Springs Photo Festival has signed on to the Bill of, Photo Bill of Rights. And we, um, and Focus on Women, another group that I'm a part of, we're signing on to the Photo Bill of Rights. It's really, we want to see the whole community work together and we look forward to uh, however we can do that. So please come to me if any of you here see that we can do more, um, please let us know. Thanks, everyone. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody from Palm Springs, if Jeff needs to say uh, goodbye, but um, <laughs> I don't know if he's back there. You never know where anybody is. Anybody? I'm here. <laughs> okay. I'm so. here, and I just want to thank you all as well. This was a really great conversation, and I'm proud of it, and it's a hell of a way to kick off the first night. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for to Juliet. Thank you for having us. Thank thank you. Thank you. So we're, hopefully we can all meet up at the actual one that's going to be in uh, April. April, 25th to the 30th next year. Fly us yeah. out. Awesome. Bring these people. people. Good all <laughs> up to you, Just Jeff. say the word. Let's do it. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Right. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you.